Uh, should we call this session to order? If you would like to settle down. Are there two gentlemen there, if you'd like to sit down? I guess a couple of people will keep filtering in, so that's normal after the coffee break. Okay. We have lost about 10 minutes of this session. We were supposed to start at quarter past 11 and go on till 1. But anyway, nevertheless, the, uh, we may then continue till pa uh, 5 past 1 or whatever, eat into your lunch break. Uh, I think uh, everybody here knows the speakers on this panel. Their resumes are there in the booklet, which was part of the package which was available. So uh, the way I think we can proceed is 15 minutes per speaker, then we throw the session open to questions, and then um, we again give uh, five, five minutes to the speakers to uh, make their concluding remarks. Just uh, to set the ball rolling, this session is uh, about uh, the financial sector and what have been the lessons learned post the crisis and so on and so forth. And this is a seminar which is uh, looking at G20 issues. So while I will request the speakers to, uh, to deal with the topic as they think best, if they could also kind of, if possible, wherever possible, correlated to the situation in India and how we have progressed uh, in the last seven years since the last financial sector meltdown. In that context, as we all know, uh, the G20 uh, empowered the FSB, the Financial Stability Board based in Basel, to look at a number of issues uh, post that crisis, particularly over the counter derivatives, uh, credit derivatives, and I'll stop there on derivatives, in terms of financial supervision, uh, liquidity, risks as well as leverage risks and so on and so forth. I won't go on because the speakers I'm sure will deal with all these topics and uh, I will at some stage uh, try and summarize what they have said and also provide my comments. So without further ado, maybe we just proceed from my right to the left uh, and the ladies are conveniently sitting on the right so therefore ladies first. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, title of the session is Post-Crisis International Financial Regulation and so on. I'm going to take a slightly different approach and I think it's probably closest to the excellent speech that we all, those of you who he were here last night, uh, heard by Mr. Mr. Nayak. And I'm, I'm going to basically cover, uh, talk about financing needs and sources of financing, uh, but place India in a, in a regional perspective. It's not quite the G20, but many of them are G20 countries as well and then ask the question whether India's financial system is up to the task and, and talk at the end very little, bit, very little on, on the planned uh, reforms uh, and unfinished agendas. So very quickly on financing needs, all of you, actually we heard quite a lot about it yesterday uh, already. Uh, there are you know, fairly big needs coming up. Uh, it, the Asian region itself, and, and India is no exception, faced with multiple long-term challenges, uh, demographic transitions, a rising middle class, much more rapid urbanization, which is expected, uh, and therefore massive infrastructure gaps, and the need for social inclusion and environmental sustainability. <clears throat> and the financing needs to address these challenges are really, uh, n without joking, a, a trillion dollar question. The, world, uh, the UN and the ADB have estimated that uh, the funding requirements for Asia is about a trillion dollars. Uh, roughly broken up into poverty reduction, so raising uh, uh, the uh, population to, um, to $2 a day, uh, meeting the remaining MDGs, and then the biggest ticket item of, of all, of course, is infrastructure, which about, again, about which we heard uh, a lot yesterday uh, uh, in the panel that had Alok Sheel and, and Rajiv Lal and everyone else. Um, infra infrastructure gaps are massive in Asia, uh, the point, again, I don't want to belabor this, um, the point is that emerging Asia has larger infrastructure gaps even than emerging 
Europe and, and Latin America, and, and we've heard about how these infrastructure gaps have impeded growth, et cetera. Something very well known, but the po only point I want to make here is uh, Asian countries are facing a demographic transition that can really shape the region's growth prospects. But more importantly, they can, uh, we think that these differential trends can have major implications for the quantity of savings, their location, the asset classes that will need to be developed to adapt to these trends. And so uh, the, the main point of putting out the slide is to say that you know, we need to also be thinking about what's going on in the rest of the region, India, is still going to be on the positive end of the demographic transition, whereas the other countries are on the other end, and what implication that has for uh, financial flows and financial integration. Uh, urbanization process in Asia is only just beginning, even though we've had a big wave in the last, uh, in the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, India, of course, the urbanization is still relatively low. Uh, and then the main point of this, of course, is that uh, the present levels of urban infrastructure are grossly inadequate to meet the demands of this, this uh, trend of uh, urbanization that's, that everyone believes is going to happen. By 2020, Asia will have the largest middle class and then the rest of the world combined. And again, this is going to put dem uh, create demands for better public services, uh, education, health, et cetera. And finally, uh, maybe not finally, but just, just uh, on inclusive growth, uh, you know, of course, Asia's past experience has been that um, a, a massive uh, economic success, but it has come at the price of increasing environmental damage and rising inequality. Um, so, you know, at the, at the time, at the same time that Asia needs to think about growth models, et cetera, that we talked about yesterday, um, social spending and social assistance coverage are low, and these will need to be stepped up. Uh, and then, of course, environmentally sustainable growth. I won't say much about this. This is just a chart showing carbon dioxide emissions and Asia and Pacific are uh, off the charts in terms of how high they are. So what can we say then about sources of funding in Asia? The bulk of the funding is now in private hands. Official development assistance is very small. Uh, government revenues uh, you know, are uh, small compared to the potential investable private money that's, that's available. Uh, and amongst the private money, there's remittances, there's FDI inflows, private savings and, and, and pension. So the large amounts of money are now in private sector hands. And the question is, how does one intermediate those into uh, de delivering the development uh, or meeting the challenges that I just outlined? A quick word on public finances. That's not going to be what I'm mostly talking about. Um, you can see here emerging Asia is, is below most of the other regions. Uh, emerging markets in other regions in terms of revenue collection. Uh, you and India I, I don't need to be told what the challenges are, but that's, it's common even amongst other countries in Asia. Besides uh, raising, public, uh, raising revenue, the public sector, of course, also has an important role in providing an enabling domestic environment. So let me just quickly go over um, um, what's the, what the other sources of uh, financial um, raising finan finances are. Capital markets, such as bond and equity markets, provide alternative channels of funding and investment for public and private sectors. Um, and what you can see here is that um, the, uh, you know, the, you have two countries, Hong Kong and Singapore, that have very large financial uh, sectors, and then a wide variety of other um, um, countries where India is, again, towards the uh, smaller end of the, of the distribution. Government ownership of banks is fairly common, but again here India and China stand out. That's the first panel, uh, first chart on this panel. Uh, foreign control, by contrast, foreign ownership of uh, uh, banks is relatively limited in Asia, with Hong Kong and uh, New Zealand being, uh, being the exception. And um, um, let me just also put the same chart, but in, in uh, comparison with other regions, you'll see again that India has a much larger government ownership of financial institutions relative to uh, other regions and other countries. What about uh, financial deepening? There has been progress in financial deepening, um, meaning the ratio of you know, credit to, uh, to GDP. But, but um, again, there's, there's been two, there's more scope to do more financial deepening and that's something that India has recognized and many initiatives have been taken recently. Um, within Asia, the corporate sector certainly dominates um, uh, the uh, lending from banks. Uh, corporate lending dominates uh, 
in, in many of these, so on the left-hand side chart, many countries. But as you'll see in the next chart, um, sorry, in, the, in an, the moving to India here, you have India really does stand out as where bank credit is mostly directed to the corporate sector. And here I want to talk a little bit about the continued concerns about asset quality and profitability. It is an outlier amongst emerging markets with the, with, uh, as far as the share of uh, bank credit that goes to uh, the non-financial corporate sector. But what it does is that it puts the corporate banking nexus, I think, in, in, in clearer, in, in sharp perspective. So despite recent improvements in macroeconomic fundamentals, a historically high share of debt is owed by firms with weak fundamentals in India. So the first decade of the 2000s was a period of robust economic expansion, accompanied by a strengthening of India's corporate balance sheets. Now with profitability rising, capital investment did increase, particularly in the years before the global financial crisis. But in recent years, various indicators of corporate financial health have deteriorated. And um, um, of course, most of it was driven by public sector banks for infrastructure projects. Corporate leverage has risen rapidly, and although it is a lower than the peaks that were reached in 2010 and 11, it's still at a historically high level. Indian corporates are now much more leveraged uh, when, than compared to their emerging market peers. That's the panel on the right-hand side. And, and using four indicators to gauge corporate health, which is the ICR, ICR, profitability, liquidity, and leverage, we find that corporate stress in India is the highest that it's been since the early 2000s. Um, let me quickly talk about banking sector vulnerabilities. Um, as a result of the weakening of the corporate balance sheets and diminished profitability, you are seeing also asset quality being uh, weak, especially in public sector banks. Those are the banks, uh, those are the ones that are shown on the right hand side of the first panel. And provisioning levels are relatively low compared with other emerging markets. Um, Banking sector's loss-absorbing buffers, you know, defined as tier one capital plus loan loss reserves and uh, at relative to non-performing loans, is actually quite low. And profitability, of course, is, is uh, in PSBs, is uh, low reflecting uh, operating inefficiency. Now, of course, everyone knows the big challenge in India is, to, uh, is for investment to pick up, particularly infrastructure investment, be it by the public or the private sector. But this high leverage that I just talked about has hindered corporate investments in India. Um, and, and that beg, you know, calls into question where all this growth that uh, is needed um, to, to uh, address the development needs that I talked about is gonna come from. Um, certainly, um, there's room now. India has a, a, a huge windfall from the oil price collapse, the benign inflation outlook and uh, fiscal savings and so on that come from the deregulation of, these, of uh, fuel prices. So there's clearly room to do more. The question is, can the banking system uh, you know, be called upon to, uh, to fill these needs? Uh, we've done a you know, a, um, stress test of, uh, this is from the IMF team's work that was published in, I believe, March this year. Um, stress tests of banks' balance sheets indicate that the public sector banks are especially vulnerable to change in classifications of a significant share of restructured loans. So we're not, I mean, I, I don't want to leave the impression that, you know, this is a, a, a big crisis, but it's certainly a uh, fairly high capital need, and the question becomes, you know, where is this money going to come from, and, if, and where is this capital going to be raised from? And unless banks have a significant, uh, uh, a comfortable cushion of capital, whether they're going to be able to finance um, the needs. Uh, then we've also added capital needs uh, from arising from the adoption of Basel III, and of course that's an additional amount, again, not giving the sense that we're talking about a crisis, but, but lo potentially large capital injections will be needed uh, in public sector banks. So the question is, are, is this model of dominant public sector banks the way forward for India? You'll have many people commenting that, you know, uh, that there's actually been quite a lot of convergence between the public sector banks and the private sector banks. They're broadly comparable, et cetera. So what really is the difference? And what we found actually in some work that I did uh, with Poonam, who's sitting here, uh, public sector banks tend to lend a smaller share of their assets to the private sector. Uh, they prefer to invest in government securities. So they are generally profitable, well-capitalized, and safe. <laughs> 
but they underlend to the private sector and they overinvest in government securities. I don't need to tell the audience in this room what are the possible explanations. Um, you know, clearly lower risk weights and capital costs for government securities, let, very little risk of default. And then there are also the whole issue that uh, uh, Dr. Nayak uh, mentioned yesterday about asymmetric incentive structures, you know, uh, no rewards for high profitability, large penalties for decisions that go bad, et cetera, and the moral hazard associated with, with, having, with being uh, in the public sector. So then uh, let me just talk very quickly about the, the, the um, reforms that have just been announced. Um, the seven-point program to reform banks, which is focused on strengthening corporate governance, um, um, selective infusion of capital into PSBs, uh, and then addressing the NPL and debt, uh, issue and debt resolution. And the second initiative, which is the um, uh, entry of private deposit taking small finance banks, uh, specialized payments banks, et cetera. Now, as with all of these things, uh, they, they, in some ways, you, these reforms do address the main problems that are outlined in, uh, that I outlined earlier in public sector banks. But, but the question is, first, the proof of the pudding is going to be in the implementation and how much of this actually is going to work. And then I, I just want to leave you with the thought that was raised first by Dr. Nayak yesterday at dinner, which is, even if this were to work, uh, it, is it, is it? really the case that a dominant public sector banking system with all of its um, narratives around incentives, et cetera, will serve India well in the next uh, 10 to 20 years? And this is a question I think that, I mean, I know it's, a, it's politically an extremely difficult question to use the P word, the privatization word, but certainly it's a question that we have to ask ourselves now. Uh, and, and we went through a lot of discussion yesterday about whether, um, you know, that uh, privatization or moving to greater private sector ownership is the uh, is the answer, but I think the question certainly ne deserves to be asked. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy, and thank you, Rajat, for uh, inviting me here. I'm going to talk about the lessons learned from the global crisis for financial regulation. Obviously, there are so many lessons that in, a, in 15 minutes, I'm not going to be able to cover uh, even a very small portion of uh, what has been learned, but just some of the key uh, lessons and their implications for India. Uh, the best way perhaps to uh, put this is that before uh, the crisis, financial regulation used to focus on risks of uh, firms and to uh, in try and ensure the soundness and safety of financial firms. So looking at one firm at a time and trying to minimize the monitor and minimize the risk that uh, the firm takes so that the firm does not go bankrupt. However, it, what uh, as Percy Mystery puts it, what was learned was that if giving four housing loans to a Mexican gardener can trigger one of the biggest financial crises of the century, then surely there was something else that we were missing. There was something very important to the system that was being missed. It could cause not just many, many banks to shut down, it could cause not, not only financial firms to shut down, crisis to the, the whole system in many places to fall apart, the real economy to get hurt from which we are still trying to recover, and taxpayers having to pay uh, for a large uh, amount of losses that uh, were incurred. In fact, the whole politics of many countries has changed thanks to the uh, crisis. Now, uh, the uh, result of uh, this part of the lesson, this part of the lessons from the crisis has been that one of the key uh, uh, bases, the, the reasons to regulate finance is to protect consumers. Now, whether you're protecting consumers uh, by the laws that you write, by the institutions that are created, or through redress mechanisms, or through try to prevent mis-selling to consumers, that was not something that was as clear before the crisis as uh, after it. 
broadly, this has led to four uh, new areas of focus in financial regulation at the national level, and I'll come to the international level at the very end. But at the national level, the four areas of focus, and many of the G20 countries have, uh, are already in the process of changing their laws and setting up new, ins new institutions for these. The four areas are consumer protection, microprudential regulation, where the two new areas are systemic risk and resolution. So consumer protection lies at the heart of all these four because ultimately what one is trying to do is not just protect consumers through setting up a, a protection agency which uh, takes in, uh, which looks at their grievances or addresses their complaints or makes sure that there is, uh, that there are advisors who don't uh, Miss sell products that they don't. Uh, there, there are proper disclosures and so on. So that's that's one part of it. But also, micro at the heart of microprudential regulation also lies the protection of the consumer, because what you're trying to do is that the firm uh, is ultimately uh, uh, it's consumers who lose when a firm shuts down. Not only lose their money, but also lose loss of financial services. So to address that, you say set up a framework for resolution so that the loss to consumers is minimum. It is not the taxpayer who ends up paying for the loss to consumers. It may be the shareholders who lose out, but it is who, the one who's protected, and therefore the, the way the framework needs to work is such as to protect the consumers. Similarly, another, the uh, fourth uh, area that is new after uh, looking at what, uh, and understanding what happened in the uh, crisis is systemic risk. That earlier it was thought that it was enough to look at each firm to make sure that the firm was safe and sound. But now it was understood that no, that wasn't enough. That what you could have is Either you could have a firm that was, as uh, we often call it, too big to fail, that when it failed, the whole system uh, fell apart, or it was too networked to fail, like the case of Bear Stearns, where even though it wasn't too big perhaps, but the way it was in the system was that it was too networked to fail. And the US approach primarily focuses on systemically important large or too networked firms, but it could also happen because many firms behave similarly during a crisis. So if all of them have housing loans, you can have many firms uh, getting into uh, <laughs> trouble at the same time, also because the way the regulations are is such that that leads to similar behavior. Their incentives are similar, and thus their behavior is similar. And a whole new field of macroprudential has now, it's, it's still an area of